Hi everybody and welcome back to Grow Physio. So this is the section where we really look at how we try and prepare you guys for match day. This might be in a match day scenario, it might be a training session, or you might be even traveling with a, with a team to maybe a certain event or fixture. Now, some of the information that is in here will help to bolster and build your awareness of how to manage certain situations. It doesn't replace a recognized qualification regarding match day, but it will certainly help you a great deal with some of the different considerations that you need to make. So what are we going to look at? So the overview wise, it is a very quick talk this, so we'll fly through this. Preparation, so you need to have a checklist and we'll go through exactly what you guys need if you are potentially going to be put into a match day, a training or an away fixture. Other things to look at are the differences between the daily uh, requirements, what you have with a home fixture versus an away fixture, clearly the opposition that you're playing, particularly if you're traveling a considerable distance within your own country or playing internationally, they're going to have a better idea of what is going on local to them. So do draw upon their knowledge and I'll tell you some of the things that sort of can help facilitate that a little bit better. We'll also talk about emergencies and action planning. So when things do go wrong, again, making sure that you are as prepared as you possibly can be should something happen, because it is going to be an adrenaline fueled environment that you are in at the time, really. So everything that you've done planning wise will hopefully transfer a bit more smoothly if you are familiar with all of the people around you, the kit, etc. So from that, we'll look at the pitch side and trauma bag contents, the things that I would put into a physio bag, the things that also go into a trauma bag. And I've got some help from a really amazing doctor working in their premiership rugby who's gone through the trauma bag with me as well. The other things you need to think about are wound management and then also concussion, which is a, a big topic and needs to be managed appropriately. So in terms of planning and preparations, why do we do it? Well, clear reasons. It's benefiting the athlete, the staff and the spectators who are involved. Who's involved in the process? Well, it's all staff, particularly medical staff will maybe lead on this, but everybody needs to know the protocol. So do make them available and share them amongst that local medical team and the wider backroom staff. You also need to make sure on the back of that, that they all understand what those protocols mean, both in theory and then also put it into practice. So make sure you are going through regular training. Also make sure that you are going through equipment checks. So that needs to be replenished um, as soon as something has been used. Don't assume that it is exactly as you left it. There may be other people who have access to the trauma bag. They may have taken things out. Things may have become out of date. They might have been taken out by a sort of medical admin or support team, and they're waiting for a replacement to come in. The storage of them is a legal requirement as well. So make sure that they are stored appropriately. Again, as I alluded to before, make sure that you practice. If you've done a qualification, in pitch side management, that is only the beginning. Your skill set will reduce significantly over, an, over a period of time. To retain those skills, again, you need to keep practicing and do it with the individuals who you're going to work with on the day. Some of them will not be medical. You don't often have a full medical entourage with you who all are familiar with the kit. So you will have to put in set times that you go through this at regular intervals throughout the season. You do need to remain current. There are guidelines that change all the time and there's research going on <laughs> all the time as well. So the other things, trauma and extrication we'll plan you for. Again, we'll talk about head and concussive injuries and also sort of medical related problems. As with everything, you want to try on the back of this. Think about what went well, what maybe didn't go quite so well. What are you going to do differently? And again, that might form something individually, but do a debrief as a team. So you are likely to have stipulations that are from governing bodies. So if you're working in football, the FA will stipulate how many doctors you have, how many physios you should have, whether the paramedics are present, is there going to be nurses there, what's the medical facility like, is it suitable for purpose? 
Now, that is something that you need because you need to uphold that. That is likely to be audited on a regular basis. And if it isn't audited, audited and you're in sort of a lower level environment, again, you need to make sure that you have gone through those suitable checks and made sure that you are adhering to necessary guidelines that may be in your own governing bodies, be it sports therapy, physiotherapy, etc. This is the uh, exact pre-match medical sort of checklist that we had really when we were in the sort of Heineken's Champions Cup um, and Challenge Cup really. So it was uniform across both events. One thing that you definitely need to do, which I would certainly instill, is the preparation that you do beforehand will almost certainly determine whether you are successful when something happens. Now that goes from something as simple as preparing the training room. So you can see there on the left hand side, not all training rooms are going to look like this. This is probably the, the epitome at Newcastle United when we played there. So, but you can see the kit man has sort of laid out all the kit. We've got all the foam rollers, all the, ba the bands for mobility related issues that are there and they're accessible. There's physio beds again, present for any sort of assessments, be it half time, whatever. And then we've got a separate room that we're doing a lot of our preparation in. Now you might in these sort of situations where you may be in a less luxurious change room, which we are a lot, is almost think about alternative ways that you can display some of the equipment really. So we used to take a travel table on a lot of occasions. Sometimes there wasn't enough space for that. Sometimes we were literally working in the shower areas of changing rooms, but again, contact your opposition, find out what the facilities are. They may be able to WhatsApp you a picture of what you are being given and you can plan out how that room is going to look. On the right hand side here, you can see this was a typical presentation thing that we would do pre-strapping. Rather than scrambling around in the bottom of bags and boxes to try and find what we needed, we laid out exactly what we thought that we needed. So everything that's there, we'd use. This is a big point really, and home fixtures versus away fixtures, most of the time, home-wise, you're gonna pull something together if you don't have it. If you're away from home, again, the opposition may lend it to you. However, if it's not available, it's something specific that you need, again, it is a uh, imperative that you take it with you. So do make sure that you have packed yourself and make sure you check each time that you've got everything on a checklist, which I'll show you later. That came to haunt me one time where basically I forgot the beds um, and we ended up working out the back of this sort of amazing salon, actually uh, an away game really. Um, so the head physio got this amazing salon. I ended up in this horrible little sort of shower cubicle really, um, basically with a, a thrown together couple of tables with a towel over the top to try and pretend um, that actually we hadn't made this blunder and it was all a, a positive thing that they'd offered us. Um, but again, when sort of little creatures start creeping along the floor and what have you, it's not great. So you definitely need to just tick off everything in a methodical fashion. The other thing that can happen is obviously traveling away. You may well be on a bus that has great facilities like you can sort of see here. This was our team bus that, um, again, it has sort of ovens and all the fridges and all the kind of mod cons, like little coffee machines in, but that's very unique really. The other thing that you may end up doing is actually strapping on the bus itself. So you may well get stuck in traffic. There may be some issues with almost access routes or whatever, and you're running late and you end up having to adapt. So do think about that as a possibility. Have certain uh, backup plans and contingencies that maybe you keep the taping separate. You keep the obviously the defib accessible and then also have things like sort of a first aid kit available as well. The bits along the bottom are things that we would have used in that environment for an away day. So on the left hand side on the bottom there you can see sort of a, a fairly sturdy box where we would keep tape um, and some of the other sort of dispensables really. The good thing with them is they often open up and you can almost access everything from them. So try and get ones that almost fold out so you can see everything. You're going to have a lot of kit if you are traveling with a team. So I think it's really good to make sure that you have a lock um, a locked sort of storage container for that. And again, it's going to be pretty heavy. So you may want to stick that on a set of wheels. And also the thing that you need is a, is a file with all the personal details, the next of kins, all the allergies, all of the contact details that may be in the case of an emergency that you can draw upon. So you need to have all these facilities available. Other things in the medical area, uh, in that sort of first aid box, again, you're going to have things that are potentially required by those individuals. So that might be if you've got diabetics, little sugar uh, supplements, glucose gels, that kind of thing. Um, it might be that you have painkillers, anti-inflammatories, if you've got um, 
potentially sort of doctors or medics with you as well. But you may be the person who travels, the, the doc might be going with someone else. So you are then the lead medic maybe on that bus. So think about that and what can happen in a sort of disaster situation. Other things from a, a planning perspective that you definitely need is a list of strapping. So in rugby, we always met about two hours before the, the game. We'd normally be strapping two or maybe three physios for about an hour and a quarter before the game. So there's a lot of preparation work. Some of that is rubs as well. Uh, some of the soft tissue techniques that maybe the, the individuals require or request pre-game. But again, have a time schedule so you can almost stick to it accordingly. You're going to get to know your, your individuals who are in your squad and which individuals require certain strapping and how long they take. So we would plan that accordingly. On the right hand side as well, again, if it's a maintenance thing, so you might have a, a ream of students maybe helping you pre-game if that's appropriate or even afterwards as a recovery massage. But again, create a timetable so everyone can plan and also the individuals can also plan that into their pre-match routine. Some people will become very uh, grumpy if you then are not running to time or you're not on their schedule because they've maybe planned in kicking, talking to the referee, having stud checks, talking to their fellow teammates. Maybe they have certain tunes they want to listen to beforehand. But again, all of this stuff will form part of their preparation. So in terms of sort of your own kit that you're going to carry maybe onto the pitch as a sports physio. So again, sort of on the left hand side, that was my bag that I used and, and sort of me in that sort of situation really. You've got almost like a handbag scenario where it can sling over your shoulder. The middle one is something that I used to use. It's sort of a one arm sort of strap if you like, that goes across um, your body. Again, you've got the option that it can kind of swivel around um, and you can kind of access things and then turn it around the other way that I quite liked. The other thing some people use is this sort of bum bag, sort of fanny pack scenario really, where again, you're going to put in there just the essential bits of equipment that you need. So this is sort of more in a rugby league environment. You see these sort of, um, sort of bum bags a little bit more. Again, it's sort of drawing upon things on a quick, um, quick access really. If you are on and off the pitch, but you potentially need a lot more things, again, you can go for the sort of option on the left-hand side. So again, from physique, these uh, are some of the sort of common bits of equipment that I would have had in my pitch side bag at the time. So I'd have a rigid tape. I'd also have an EAB, like an elastic adhesive bandage. Again, really useful bits of um, kit. It might go around something to reinforce it. Um, you may want to use something like a tear light potentially, maybe to sort of almost put a, a head um, protector on people, that kind of thing. You also need to make sure that you've got spare gloves. So what I would normally do, because there may be blood fairly instantly, rather than me rummaging around, I'd have my gloves on at all times. But then what I'd have inside the glove is maybe like a rolled up bit of gauze. So in there, you can draw it out of your glove, and then you can apply it immediately to stem any blood flow. Other things that you're going to have, your scissors, maybe things that need to cut through things potentially if you wanted to try and almost um, assess something that's maybe been taped up. And the other thing you're likely to have pitch side is some ice. So you will, again, preparation wise, cre create some ice bags. So you've almost put ice cubes. Ideally, crushed ice would be brilliant. It might be that you've just got cold packs that you activate by sort of pressing a button. But the other thing you might need is this uh, almost like wrap. So you can use a cling film wrap. So that may, it's far cheaper and far more effective at just almost attaching the ice onto whatever that injured component is. The other things that I'd always carry are water, again, really useful for hydration, obviously, but also potentially if someone gets something in their eye, like a bit of mud, or they want to clean it, or they want to clean their hands, um, again, you can kind of draw upon that, really. Other things, again, sort of the people request are salt. So if they are struggling with cramp or they've got little salt imbalances, some of these pre-made drinks are great. You might just want to make them up yourself. And also, I would always carry, because we always had a, a diabetic in our squad, are these sort of glucose, high sugar pouches, really. So if someone does have a hypo, you can draw upon that really quickly. Other things that I would have in my kit bag, which are more to do with the individuals who are in your squad, but are worth considering. Again, you need to get these before the game and make sure that you're not then running back into the changing room, into their bags to go and get them. So on the left-hand side there, you've got one of our players who has donated their... Uh, sort of inhaler related to asthma. Again, it needs to be their own inhaler because they're all at different concentrations. They know what's in it. 
some people will have the if someone's obviously in a, in a sort of serious situation um, and there's no inhaler available and they're having an asthmatic attack in that sort of situation you may bend the rules a little bit but really a lot of these uh, are related to a TUI so you need to make sure that this is a legal um, concentration and again if you start messing them around make sure you put the name on that individual the other thing in the middle there that you can see is a, almost a diabetic sugar related monitor. So some of the athletes may well have these sort of really fancy chips. We had one in our squad that you can see there on the sort of left middle there. And what it is, is a permanent patch that is inserted into that individual on the inside of their arm, typically. So if they are playing a contact sport, ideally it won't get clawed off. Um, it's not um, completely stuck on if you do rip it off it will come out but again if someone is having a hypo you may be able to use their little monitor and hover it over it it will give you a bluetooth reading the alternative is that sort of bottom left one that you can see there where you have a diabetic bag this is more common and then they all you bring the diabetic bag out and they do their own checks really to get a bit of a gauge on their blood sugars other things on the right hand side so you may have athletes who have uh, contact lenses, maybe normally wear glasses, but then on game day, obviously kind of wear a contact lens. Now this typically for me is the worst possible injury. I think that you can kind of, if you call it that, or job to do, because this is so fiddly. Let's say someone has hands that are covered in mud and you can't get them clean enough, and you are being asked to put in their contact lens, obviously if you are then going towards somebody's eye with your finger, the natural response is that they shut their eyes so quite often they end up just flicking the contact lens out and then trying to find it is an absolute nightmare so what i would do if you at all possibly can is carry a towel in that bottom right hand corner use your water let them clean their own hands and then almost get them to dry it and then put their own contacts in ideally they're going to be far better at it and far more efficient than you will other things related to wound management that I would have in my kit bag, again, at all times, would be some of these dressings that maybe you want to apply on there. I'd always be carrying gauze. So gauze really useful for almost stemming blood, covering blood. It's really super absorbent. Um, you may need to use the ones that are in your glove initially, and then almost that initial stem of the blood is great. Obviously, the athlete can hold on to it if it's a head injury themselves. Just apply their fingers onto where you want them to apply the pressure and hold it on there while you get the bits and pieces out of your kit bag. You can also get these gauze almost like dressings, so you're almost wrapping it around. Not used a great deal for me, to be honest, but again, if it was a big gash somewhere um, and you need to package that to send off, that might be something that you would use. The alternative is used to to use the gauze and then maybe use a tape over the top if they're going to continue. Vaseline or sort of petroleum jelly again is a really useful um, adjunct really. So particularly if someone's got a fairly superficial wound that isn't gaping open, something like a Vaseline over the top, if it's on a knee, for example, it might just help it sort of slide a little bit better, maybe stop things getting into it to stop infection. Um, but again, sort of various different options that you have there. Other thing that was in there, saline pods, so sterile water. Again, if you've got something in someone's eye, for example, you don't really want to be putting mucky water in there in case it gets infected. So these sterile pods are really useful. The other thing which is really good with them is you can create quite a lot of pressure. So if someone does have some, uh, sort of some debris or some soil or something that's in a wound, again, you can kind of blast it out with these saline pods. For bigger uh, blood-related disorders that you can have so this is a common occurrence in rugby where we've done exactly what we said there we've tried to stem the blood he's held the gauze on he's then almost bled through that we've tried to strap around it but actually there's just too much blood to cope and it starts to sort of come out the bottom of that that sort of eyebrow really it looks like that he's cut here so what i'm doing on there is almost filtered into the doctor to to get the sort of preparation ready for some suturing and what does that look like? So on the left-hand side, we've got a suturing kit. So I used to do a bit of suturing, but I would never do anything facial. If there was something that was, um, again, you need to have the correct qualifications to do this and make sure that you are trained and rehearsed in it. But typically it is the doctor who does this. If you are stuck in the middle of nowhere and you have no other option and it's something that is fairly well covered, sometimes like an eyebrow, um, they are ones where if you have had the necessary training, which I had done, um, then again, you may be called upon to do that. For smaller uh, cuts, 
Again, some of these sort of butterfly or steri strips, they're quite useful again, just to almost with a more superficial thing to hold uh, the wound together. On the right hand side, particularly useful for scalps are things like staples. Again, they are um, better in a scalp because you're probably not going to see it um, as much. But again, they're quite good to draw the skin together. So that's the staple that you can see underneath there and the staple remover. So the staples will stay in for a set amount of time and then obviously be removed. At the bottom there, what you've got is an applicator of a, of a skin glue. So again, in certain situations, maybe less vulnerable positions that are um, starting to gape open a little bit, you might be able to hold it with glue and not require stitches. So in terms of sort of accessing the game itself, the other things that you need to be aware of really is sort of, do you have unlimited access to the pitch or, or do you need to be uh, called upon and being given the green light really from the officials who are there? And the laws of the game will more than likely determine that. Now, in certain situations, you naturally will have to get on if you see somebody go down. I'm thinking more sort of cardiac related. Don't wait for somebody to almost give you the green light because it's very time sensitive. For other situations, again, on the left hand side, football is very bench based. The, the physios are on the bench with the management, the team um, sort of substitutes and people like that, really. And they wait to be beckoned on. And the reason for that is almost once a medic goes onto the pitch in football, that individual has to come off the pitch until the next uh, breakdown in play be it a throw in, a corner, a goal, offside, whatever it may be. That's very different in rugby. So again, what we did was we patrolled the sidelines really. So we followed the play so we could be there as soon as we possibly could. And that's just to, due to the nature, A, of the sort of contact and also making sure that we have the player welfare because their risk is likely a lot higher. So you're going to, again, sort of be watching vigilantly as things go on um, and almost filter that back on a mic. So what do we filter back really so when you are on the pitch again if you have the access to a radio it is a brilliant form of communication for anyone in my early days i didn't have it and what you're almost doing is asking players to pass on messages um, to other players and then filter it back into the manager that way it's a bit of a nightmare it's also a bit of a nightmare when you get to someone and someone's screaming in your ear trying to find out what's going on so what do you need to give them well you need to let them know who the player is and what their status is. So quite often what happens is it might have gone down under a sort of melee, you can't see from the sideline because they're not elevated and they've got this restricted view from the sideline so they can't even see who it is. So I'd always say, look, it's uh, such and such player, um, they are currently unconscious conscious, um, what has been going on and what has happened. In terms of sort of additional information with that, again, what you need to do is almost add a brief plan to that. So always let them know in layman's terms what the area of the body is uh, that's affected. And I would just relay a simple mechanism. So it might be they've taken an impact, they've twisted something, they've maybe jarred something, they felt something go, they've pulled up with what appears to be a tear of a muscle tissue, something along those lines. And then the extra bit of information is really important. And again, people will read between the lines, but again, it's better if you agree this um, before the game. So my information, if I'm assessing somebody, again, you've got your radio on, so you've got talk going on in the background quite often between the team manager and the coaches about what they're going to do if this person is not available to continue. They want updates before you've even had a chance to talk to them. And it can be difficult again with sort of crowd noise and things as well. But things I would generally relay, this individual or this athlete should be able to continue. How is that interpreted? Well, there's probably no action required. If I need to assess this, I need a little bit of time to make a clinical decision on what I'm going to do. So the way that the coaches often hear that is they're going to get a substitute ready just in case it goes down the route where this individual cannot continue on. The other way that it's going to be is almost they are unlikely or they are unable to continue. So clearly, if they cannot continue, the, the likelihood is, is they're going to need to come off the field of play and be substituted. So fundamentally, what the coaches want to know in general is can they continue? Are we going to monitor them or are we going to make a change? So those three things is really what you need to be very clear on. 
Now, that's really difficult depending on that acute presentation. So if it is someone who was obviously pulled up with a hamstring tear, for example, they're very sore, sharp pain on any sort of uh, knee, uh, yeah, knee flexion resistance, then again, the likelihood is they're going to come off immediately. If they've taken a band, again, it might well settle down after a little bit. Going to if it's someone who maybe has uh, some symptoms that are suggestive of a tightness or a tear, again, you might want to monitor them, but it's important to relay if you think that this individual is at risk of developing a higher grade tear or at sort of increase of increased risk of secondary injury again you need to relay that accordingly you can't bring everybody off because otherwise uh, with any sort of ailment at all but at the same time you need to make an educated decision on what you're going to do so that sounds dead simple but it can go the other way so you can have some blunders really Things that have happened in my time that are just examples of things that you need to check is the channel. So we've had situations where we're right in the middle of a game and then all of a sudden um, some feedback from a local wedding from a sort of converted sort of stable barn scenario down the road where there's a wedding going on. We start getting the wedding planner who's ticking into our um sort of channel that we're on you saying you know what the bride's about 30 seconds away 20 seconds away 10 seconds away they're about to come in and we're all listening to the the radio going well, what is all this um nonsense that's going on so again you just sort of wait for the queue which channel are we going to move to and go from there the other thing we had which happened now and again was we actually played a lot of our home games right next to newcastle airport so we ended up sometimes getting some of the interference from some of the people who were sort of working on the ground at the airport really so talking about sort of luggage that was being offloaded, etc. You'll also have situations really where you are unable to use your headset. And you can see here in that second picture, that's me with a manual inline stabilization applied. Once that is applied, you cannot take your hands off um, until you have almost three point immobilization or someone has taken over that role. So what you'll need to do in that situation, if you are first person on, is gather the information verbally, pass that across onto um, your colleagues, and then that will obviously get filtered in. Other things that you will have to give are regular updates. Now, you can see on the third picture there, so are you making a permanent or a tactical change? And you've got that option in rugby. You might not have that option in various other sports, really, but we need to let them know this was a calf tear, so it was a permanent change. Actually, if we want a tactical change, um, that's a different kettle of fish, really. The other things that you need to just think about with that are making sure that you think about what the player is hearing and what you want them to hear. So if they are right next to you, you don't want to start saying, you know what, he's definitely got a, an ACL uh, rupture if there is potential chance that he doesn't have it. And similarly, um, there may be sort of some personality bits or other elements that they you don't want them to hear really on your decision-making process. Other things that can happen is even before the game kicks off in a uh, in a warm up, people go down, and that's a bit trickier because not everybody's linked into their radio. So what you end up having is a scenario where you're almost trying to filter the information through to to sort of almost find the manager, let them know that the the likelihood is this individual is not going to continue. Um, and also, if it's an HIA, so a head injury assessment, you want to get that information on nice and early. Other things that you can have again as i said before so this individual on the top left hand corner was a nightmare in some respects an absolutely brilliant bloke so no hard feelings in that sense but if he got a bang onto the front of his knee his whole quad would turn off completely for about two or three minutes so when you're on a pitch and you're trying to make a decision but you know that that individual's power and strength and everything will come back again, but you are looking at him and you're doing your tests and it's not coming back very quickly. In terms of that, they've got a significant quad lag. They can't even hold their leg in an active straight leg ra raised position. For that period of time that they have before that almost neuromuscular wake up happens again, they are in a highly vulnerable position for future injury. So you almost want to try and keep them down. But again, Knowing your players, that important. You're going to filter that in. They are going to be okay. We just need to keep them down a little bit longer. Um, can we do anything tactically to get a little bit more time? It's always better when someone else is getting roasted on the radio. So the team manager on one situation, uh, 
the manager, the director uh, with us almost said, you know what, can you get some of the substitutes ready for coming on? Um, and basically the team manager interpreted that as let's get them on immediately. So basically, um, instead of getting them warm to be filtered into the, uh, the field of play, the decision was made by the manager instead that he just brought them straight on again. And the difference is that the director has the power to make that decision. The manager is almost the one who initiates that substitution. So he brings on the three players in the front row. It's absolutely lighting up on the uh, the radio going, why have you done that? Basically in a very censored um, sort of fashion. But then eventually they go into the scrum. We're right on our own line. If we lose the scrum, we lose the match. Basically, we win the scrum, win the ball back, score a try with this wonder try at the other end. Um, and yeah, never forget the sort of response really from that where he's like, yeah, fair play. Um, we actually probably made the right decision there. But again, make sure that the communication is clear. Other things you might be asked to do is almost relay plays. Now, I remember this specifically again. This was me sort of being asked to relay a certain play. So they've all got different names. Some of them have absolutely no sense to them. Um, I remember being asked to sort of call a, a tank or a, a something of that nature. And basically I had no idea what this was. So I'm like, what are you saying? And he's like, tank. And basically I went on, so I told them something different. Um, <laughs> and then basically, uh, yeah, trying to get that information across. Do sit down if there's certain plays that, that are being asked to be called. It's not your job as a medical professional, but you may be asked to do it. The other scenarios you might have is, I remember a, um, a new sort of senior academy physio who was stepping up, making his debut for us really on the sort of mic with the first team. Um, the thickest Northern Irish accent you have ever heard in your life. Um, and what had happened is when I'd been sort of running along the sideline, my uh, channel had flicked to the next one. So I wasn't hearing any of the comms on the radio, but I'd noticed somebody was struggling with a bit of an injury, waiting for a break in play to get on and have a look. I remember running on to see him and basically this individual, um, this Irish guy, looked like he's sort of a rabbit in headlights almost. He was like, what have you been doing? Um, I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, the radio is going mental. They can't understand me. Um, they can't work out his accent. So again, do try and be nice and clear. And that also has a, a an impact depending on the weather. So if it is windy, just put your sort of hand across the microphone. It stops cameras um, if you have them on you again, sort of... Uh, almost working out what you're saying if there's anything sensitive. So other things that you need to know is what's going to be available on site in the way of sort of emergency ambulance care, really. So are they on site? If they're not on site, how long does it take for them to arrive? How far away is that hospital? When you are ringing uh, 999 potentially to get that, if that is you or somebody else, make sure you have advised them on what you need to say. If that's not you, if you're still looking after the game and someone else is doing it, give them some medical related information so they can relay that appropriately. That is going to take place um, following the at Miss Pneumonic, if you have that, um, just to make it as clear for those individuals as possible. In terms of the emergency department, where is it? Again, how far is it? How are they going to get there? What is the relationship like if it's an away game between the club and uh, the emergency department themselves? Do they have certain specialities? If there's multiple hospitals, which ones specialise in the injury that you are presented with? Also, you need to think about the capacity and thinking in particular about wider considerations. Again, like the sort of uh, pandemic, COVID-19-wise that we're in, how many people are going to be available and are there other stresses at certain locations? You may be playing remotely. So we actually played in some pretty far away places, um, fairly isolated places in uh, bits of Wales where actually they ended up sort of potentially being air ambulanced out of there. There wasn't any scenarios, luckily, that that occurred. But again, if you are playing in the middle of nowhere, an air ambulance may be the appropriate route for you. Now, I'm just going to play you this. This is the... This is the this is George. So he is a Harlequins doctor. I'm going to play this for you, and he's going to talk you through what is inside a trauma bag. Hi, welcome to Harlequins sunny training ground in Surrey. Uh, we've just been asked to talk through our green bag, which is a standardised piece of kit that you have to have pitch side at all events. Um, so from our point of view, we'd have that at training um, as well as matches. Um, from academy age group all the way up to senior first team men and women. Um, it is part of our minimum standards, so you have to maintain this and it gets checked um, by the RFU. But any wider sports as well, you'd also have be expected to have this. And the most important thing is that 
know what's in the bag and you know how to use it so that you're in date with your training and that you do regular updates to make sure you're um, maintaining competencies. All right, so let's just run through it quickly. So it's a standardized bag, this sort of size, not too heavy, um, two main compartments. So I'm just going to open it up. And if we look inside, what you can see is there's lots of smaller compartments, color-coded and then labeled as well, okay? So I'll just walk you through it. If you think about your A, B, C, D, E approach that you would have to assessing a patient, um, player, athlete, who was um, potentially on the floor injured, you start with your airways. So in the mask bag here, currently with COVID regulations, we've got masks. We've then got CPR masks as well. And again, standardized piece of kit. Lots of information on there. Okay. Moving on further, you then think about your airways. So your simple adjuncts, such as your Cadell airways. So there's a sort of standardized green. Range of size and colors through there. Um, we have some spatulas in there as well to help you put them in, as well as some pen torches. Moving on to the next line of airways that you might need. We've got nasal pharyngeal airways, a range of sizes, and the eye gels. Again, three sizes, three units. Other things you may need to help you maintain an airway, an airway would be suction. Okay, so we have our suction devices in here. Assemble that quickly, help you out, as well as forceps as well. Okay. Moving on, thinking about oxygen to supplement the airways. In this section here, we've got some masks. This one's a nebulizer. And then the more um, back valve mask, the more established mask there. And again, some extra piping. Oxygen reservoir bag mask if you need that. We also have obviously secondary um, oxygen um, as well it's up to, uh, to supplement with that. Okay. If there's more severe airway issue, you can think about surgical airways. Um, so you've got a needle cripe set there. We've also got our um, portable mini track set, um, supplemented if required by some cannulas for a range of sizes. Also added in here we have our Russell seals as well, for any sort of penetrating chest wounds in your mother. So A means B. So that's essentially covering that first side. Just to finish off, there's a, there's a pouch here, and this is where we're keeping our um, collars, we've got two there. And uh, they're adaptable so you can arrange for whichever particular neck length you have. So moving on to the other side. In this side we're looking at blood and access, and that's why we've got these labeled as, as red. So we've got a range of candidates here. So we've got our browns, our pinks. And we've got some greens in here as well. Greens. I said brown, but they're actually grey, so of course it's that. Um, and then we, here we have some syringes and needles, which may also be required. Um, moving on, we've got our stethoscopes, tourniquets, and also through here, our blood pressure cuff as well. Okay. Once again, access if you then thinking about fluids, and on this side we've got some glucose, some normal saline, okay? Um, they come associated with their giving sets as well. And then we're moving into the resuscitation drugs up here, it's a separate pouch. And in here we've got some antibiotics, some glucose, some nebulizers, 
water to, to flush any of these drugs through and some of our more established kind of um, advanced uh, life support medications, so adrenaline, amiodarone, painkillers in the form of paracetamol, EpiPen. Um, so that essentially covers that. Um, so there we are, that's basically our bag. Um, as I say, it's all about making sure that you know how to use your kit, that you're up to date with how to use it, um, and that you practice regularly. We also have another system, just to add in finally, um, where we use a red tag and a bag if we've used something from it, or otherwise, as a quick check, if everything is fully in there, we've got a green tag. So that's just a little additional thing that we've put on there um, to make it easy to maintain um, standards and maintain a good supply of medication and equipment. Thanks very much. So yeah, brilliant. A massive thank you to George there. Me and George worked uh, at London Olympics in 2012 together with the beach volleyball and the indoor volleyball. So a massive thank you to him there. So I'm just going to quickly fly through in a little bit more detail so you can see these bits of equipment slightly better. So on the left hand side there, what you can see are those sort of oropharyngeal or those sort of Goodell uh, airways really. So in terms of those, the only thing you need to be aware of is they obviously come in different sizes. So that has to match the athlete appropriately. You're going to insert that under direct vision and often what you need to do that is use a tongue depressor. In the middle there, what you can see are the sort of nasopharyngeal airways, again, different sizes for different individuals. And the insertion of this is not upward. So you just got to make sure that you almost open that nostril on the appropriate side and then almost feed that in horizontally and ideally using something like a lubricant like KY jelly uh, and not a vas. Uh, you also, again, want to have sort of a pocket max pretty handy. So they are reusable. You can clean those um, and reuse them. Really handy bits of kit. Again, you'd have those inside your sort of kit bag. I always have one inside the car as well, just in case something does happen. Um, but you do need to change the filters with them. Other things that are essential, again, that you need to travel with and have readily available with you, particularly in sport, uh, and particularly if you are managing um, anyone and, and sort of depending on the sort of size of spectators and crowds, really, you will need to have a stipulated number of these available at certain distances as appropriate according to regulations for your venue. So, so most of these are portable. They do talk to you. They generally sort of talk you through the whole process, which is amazing um, to try and almost keep you calm. And then you've got the timings that associate with that as well. The, as George sort of mentioned, you do have your adrenalines um, and your other sort of almost stimulating drugs, really, that depending on the cycle that you are in, you may well be adding adrenaline if you're not getting the required response. On a public uh, domain, really, so if you are out and about, maybe in shopping malls, whatever, um, again, defibrillators are usually available um, to you, but they're often in these boxes, so you do need the code, so often you need to ring um, and obviously try and get that uh, code as soon as you possibly can, because the speed at which you get that on, if there is a cardiac arrest, is going to largely determine the success rate for that. Very low success rate, really, just with CPR on its own. Interesting fact, really, sort of Las Vegas has the lowest number of deaths from cardiac problems, percentage-wise, and that's because they're always found and seen on a sort of security camera and there's always one almost a, in almost every single sort of casino um, readily available so they get on really quickly and obviously help save lives in terms of the position of them they often have pictures on um, the pads in terms of the direction that you put it on and where you put it it really just has to cross the cardiac tissue and again, the sort of key with this really two different situations that have occurred. Fabrice Muamba um, was playing for Tottenham at the time when he had a cardiac arrest out of nowhere. His heart had stopped for 78 minutes, but again, he was recognised nice and early. They got the defib on as soon as possible and actually he survived. Very sadly, on the flip side, Mark Vivian Foe, he was or he almost dropped in the middle of a Cameroon game um, for no unknown, for an unknown reason and then was taken inside. And then I think that is when they then applied the sort of defib. So that speed at which you can.
There is really useful resources with the British Heart Foundation. So again, there is funding often available. So you can apply for a defibrillator if you don't have one. Um, you can get funded if you are not getting funding, then fundraising events in terms of sort of <laughs> explaining that these are life-saving bits of equipment. You should get them anyway. You should get funding from wherever you are because it's an essential bit of kit, in my opinion. If they aren't doing that, you could start a fundraising campaign, really. And you might also want to just kind of all, almost justify it if there is a bar or a restaurant that's there that actually this defib is essential if somebody goes down for whatever reason. They might choke on something, have an occluded airway, and then obviously kind of go down on the back of that. It is a legal requirement and it does save lives. Other things that you need to just think about really are so thinking about the justification routes that you're going to take that individual out You are of flying and you are bouncing around and uh, you see the sky and you see the ground, you see the sky and uh, you know exactly where you are and you keep moving, moving, you want to stop. Then the car stopped, I saw a little space to go out and I said I go out quickly and my mom will watch TV so I want to be out quite quickly and uh, say that I'm okay but uh, it's, uh, yeah, it was, it was quite, quite a big one. Quite a big one indeed. So again, depending on the environment that you are working in, you are going to have to almost look at removing people out of danger. Is it safe for you to approach it in the first place? If it's not, you need to make it safe. Um, and again, various different situations may occur and you need to think about this and have this all contingency planned beforehand. So on the top right, you can see there, a jockey comes off a horse. If they aren't trampled directly by the horse, the entourage of other jockeys on horses that are following, again, increases the risk significantly. Again, you are going to have to try if they do miss them once time round, as those horses come back round on the next lap again, look at almost trying to put something in place to protect the well-being of that individual. Quite often we as physios in rugby end up watching the game about five, ten seconds after because what happens is these scenarios in that bottom left where a, a sort of mall or something goes down, hits the floor, or there's a breakdown and almost everyone slowly peels off each other. And what you don't want to do is follow the ball because the ball might be 30 yards away and someone is lying at the bottom of that pile. Again, it depends on the environment you're in, if you may be in sort of a gymnastic world or you'll be working at sort of the Excel in London, for example. Um, what you have there is a lot of kits some really easy access, custom made bits. But again, in reality, it's very rare that you're going to have that. So you will need some extrication equipment um, for these sorts of scenarios. On the left hand side there, you can see the scoop. That's the Ferno scoop that is there. Again, really useful bit of kit. It unclips and then what you do is almost rotate the athlete sort of 15 degrees, slide one half in, roll them the other way 15 degrees and slide the other half in and it clips together. You can see there on the bottom left. Now, if it's a particularly large athlete, width wise, you can get these extenders that you can see there on the bottom left. Other things that you need are your collars. So again, get an adjustable collar, depending on the size of the athlete. Make sure when you put it on, it is stabilized and sized correctly. Make sure they aren't extending that cervical spine and make sure that they can stick their tongue out just so they've still got mobility there. The next line across there, this is your three point immobilization. So you've got your blocks, your head straps, um, and also that sort of board that it sits on there. So you cannot let go of an athlete unless someone has taken control from you or you have this three point immobilization that you can see on the bottom of that on the board. So the head will be underneath all of that. On the right hand side, what you've got are the straps. Now you definitely need to make sure that these are velcroed and prepped and put away properly because it is an absolute mess. And what you don't want to do in the, when the adrenaline is flying is almost trying to put all of this together. They are the straps that hold that individual on. So generally the colors match up and go looping around the little holes in the scoop and then back onto yourself. Other little things that you will come across, I'm sure, are things like the vac mat. So the vac mat is basically, uh, linked in with that pump. So what you are doing is not inflating it, you are taking out the air which hardens the case. So it creates a bit of a shell around that individual. So sometimes what you may do if it's a long travel, and again, the scoop is better, much better situated than a spinal board for traveling on. But again, if it is a really long commute or travel, sometimes in the right situation, what you might do is almost use just the vac mat and almost envelop that individual in there creates a shell, as I say, and holds that individual nice and still. Other things you may see in the middle are the basket, the spinal board, and then if someone is being airlifted, uh, again, these variations do occur. 
when you're sizing the individual, so on the right hand side there, you can see the sort of head physio that I work with, um, almost sizing this to the athlete. So make sure you're doing that to the side of them and make sure when you pull that apart, you are not whacking the individual or any of the people who are managing that athlete at the time. And again, once they are on there, it's going to take a significant number of people to lift and have that rehearsed which direction you are going. Make sure their head is almost going, uh, they're going forward and they're not being pulled backwards for comfort. And obviously on that, talk to that individual throughout the process and what you are going to do. Other things in terms of trauma that you might have are obviously sort of fractures. You might have dislocations. Um, again, different situations. So on the left-hand side, you've got your crutches. You want to have an adjustable pair of crutches because the individuals in your squad are more than likely going to be different sizes and shapes. To measure that, you can just let the individual, let those arms sort of hang by the side, go to the wrist crease um, and set that accordingly. In the middle, you've got an air cast boot that has an inflatable cuff inside. So once that individual has put that on, you can blow the cuff up. That will splint almost the athlete in that position. I've just put on there the uh, heel raises that you can see there sort of at the bottom. Now they're really useful if you have an Achilles rupture, what you want to try and do is almost put it into a shortened position. So sometimes you add as many of those in there as you need or they might in certain situations just help comfort wise for that individual. On the right, again, you've got various different splint options. On the top there, this is basically foam covered in plastic um, that you are basically putting around whatever limb is in question and then almost securing that in there. You might need to put in bits of towel just to add a little bit more stability, but it makes it a lot more comfortable for the individual, ideally, um, to put them in that. On the bottom there, again, vac splints, really useful. This poor bloke's going through the mill a bit. He's got three limbs that are struggling, um, but again, you can wrap that around that affected limb, draw out the air, and it hardens into almost like a cast. Other things we'd have in our trauma skip that we would take to all games is a knee support. So anyone with a significant ligamentous injury or instability, maybe from a meniscal tear, these are really useful. You can set the angles that you've got them working at um, and to try and make it as safe as possible. For the upper limb, we'd always have a, a, a sling that was there just to offload whatever tissue was affected, particularly AC joints. Um, really like that support. Stingers and things also may benefit in the middle there, you've got a sand splint, and on the right-hand side, what you've got is a pelvic belt. So on the floor and, fa and four more is the little statement, really. So long bones, maybe abdo problems, um, pelvic uh, bleeds, etc. Things as well that you are likely to need. So if anyone has had a potential brain injury, concussion in particular, um, you, what you need to do is make sure that they don't have an oxygen deficit. So you can see the oxygen chambers on the top left-hand corner there. Underneath that, what you've got is a non-rebreathe mask that you're going to use. And in the middle at the top there, just to note on that, you can see it's got a gauge and that tells you how much oxygen is still in that. So it will go almost like a fuel gauge from full to empty, green to red. Again, if that is below half, that really needs to be sent back and replaced really from practice. So to activate your oxygen, you just rip that little seal off, open the flap, attach the uh, non-rebreathe mask and get going. Underneath that, you've got a bagging system. So if someone is not ventilating or needs support themselves, again, you can use this sort of self-filling bag and squeeze that green section to almost mimic the role of breathing. So rather than maybe if you're doing sort of your two to 15 repetitions um, on a CPR scene, rather than having to manually blow, you can use these uh, self-filling bag options. On the right, just to familiarize yourself again, that is an entonox, that is a gas, that is a pain relieving gas. Um, that you may, may want to use if you are relocating a joint potentially, um, if there maybe has been some sort of neurovascular compromise or whatever and you need to relocate it, then again, Entonox, great painkiller, very fast acting, so you can almost use that, um, apply counter traction and apply that uh, sort of relocation if necessary. Keys with that is definitely not with brain injuries, definitely not with sort of lung or rib problems, um, and anyone if you sort of see them out and about uh, and doing this and they've obviously sort of fallen off something or whatever, don't use it if someone has been taking drugs. So on that really, so again, there's a load of information, but you need to go through a specific checklist. We'd go through this before every single game, home or away, to make sure we were fully prepared for whatever it was we needed. 
Same again with the braces bag and the prep bag. So I'm not going to dwell on it because you are in a position of great responsibility. These are scenarios where things can happen that are life-threatening, not just your musculoskeletal problems. These are two individuals where, again, I was sort of first on applying that manual inline stabilization with this guy on the left-hand side, Scott Wilson, you can see there, who had to retire because of a neck problem. And the same scenario on the right there with a guy called Ty Vea. Um, both tight head props, both retired based on medical advice. And what I want to do is just show you the difference between a couple of different extrications. So this was Scott on the left hand side. On the right hand side, you can see the impact that comes in on Ty. His head gets thrown into extension and then forward. So he's hit late. He's not anticipating. He's sort of relaxed. He's got the ball away. Um, and again, you can see us there. Ideally, what happens is the game is stopped. Sometimes the game may well be going on if the referee hasn't seen it. You need to be screaming to make sure that the game is stopping in this sort of situation, really. Because the repercussions, if the play carries on and someone falls on them, they have an unstable fracture uh, in that neck area, the, the consequences are not worth sort of thinking about, really. But they are significantly life-changing, if not life-threatening. So on the left, you can see... We've got a paramedic that is on site, fully rehearsed. They've got the trolley and they're taking that individual off. What we're doing here is just packaging the individual accordingly. And what I want to just show you really is the difference. So this is us walking that individual once they are onto that spinal board, onto that back mat. And you can see we're wrapping them up and we're drawing out on the right hand side the air. The key is make sure you do not walk in studs onto that back mat. Otherwise, you will create a puncture and you will no doubt be unable to make it function as a back mat. So you can see we're gradually drawing out all of the air. It does take a, a fair bit. We're all going in the direction with the feet first. We're all calling a lift. It is always ready, steady lift, not one, two, three, go, because some people will go on three, some people will go on go. So again, ready, steady, roll, ready, steady, lift, whatever the command is, again, you're going to take them off. We had it well rehearsed. This is a home game. We know the extrication route and where we're taking them. Again, you will learn all of this on the relevant qualification courses that are really vital to attend before you plunge yourself into any pitch side management. These are the uh, contact informations. If you want to pause it and contact these guys, we always did the FISIS course, which was the pre-hospital immediate care and sport course. There are alternatives out there. And what can happen when it is not rehearsed is catastrophes like this, where it looks absolutely horrendous. You've got people making blunders. It looks awful, particularly if it's on telly or whatever. Um, you do need to make sure that you have practiced. You do need to make sure that you have rehearsed with those individuals. You need to set regular points throughout the season that you are going to go through this process. I would say go through it on almost a monthly basis as a bare minimum. Um, in terms of sort of going through the practicalities of having everybody there, again, you need to be doing that, I would say, almost every six to eight weeks as an absolute um, maximum, really, because otherwise you can have this uh, calamity where it's an absolute mess. Um, other things that you need to make sure that you get right is medical capacity. You may well be given other things that you need to do, but again, do not overstep the mark. So in terms of relaying this, again, you need to be doing your regular training, familiarise yourself with the kit and think about the personnel who are going to be there. The life-saving kit is far more important than the dispensable stuff like the tape. So get that right. Think about the venue, the evaluation of the exits and the extrication routes and where that local hospital is. Opposition staff and facilities will be able to facilitate that. Um, so do liaise with them. They are going to know far better if you're going abroad again to an away game um, from there. If you're playing locally, it's probably less of an issue because you're going to know the local hospitals and the specialities. Go through the checklists. It's not exciting, but make sure you have exactly what you need. I got found out once with uh, the beds at Bedford one time, ironically, um, and never again. And do know your players. People will behave differently and react differently to certain injuries. You may have people who have recurrent injuries. So again, highlighting that may be form part of your communication in terms of how they have had a history of injuries that are maybe more vulnerable and how that injury has reacted in the past.
So do have a little think about these three different scenarios that presented to me. A lower limb fracture, whether it is stable or unstable, how are you going to manage it? Think about the spectators as well. So on a crowd, maybe someone in the crowd goes down and goes down with chest pain. And then again, if you are traveling, what if somebody has an allergy to something like nuts from there? Always reflect on it. And then there are also concussive related mechanisms that can go on in rugby. Now we talk about this loads more in the concussion section, but again, just to show you a few different uh, elements. There can be some colossal impacts depending on the sport that you are working in. Um, and again, helmets are probably not the answer and not gonna help these individuals if this happens. I just wanna show you this. So this was a, an example of somebody a fairly what looks like mainstream problem, look at the bottom. The guy at the very bottom of the screen has got his elbow in an ataxic, sort of antalgic position. Um, and again, as we sort of go back there, there's me first on uh, facilitating that Mills position. The opposition physio has been really helpful here, and obviously coming in and supporting as well. Everyone recognizes if you see these enough, whether there are unconscious athletes and the significant risk be involved. It's also important just to note that actually sometimes what happens is the mechanism does always equate to injury. The 18-year-old is seen to hit the top of the fence with his chest and was flipped in a complete somersault after his horse, Merrion Square, decided to change directions. But he manages to walk off. So if you are monitoring him, he passes his HIAs, passes his sort of concussion guidelines, you've monitored him, maybe somehow he's managed to get away with this. Other things that you might have are these so facial problems. So someone who's been whacked in the face with a hockey stick. This is what these three scenarios presented to me at the Glasgow Commonwealth Games. Ball to the face. Again, huge amounts of velocity on it on a really hard ball. It's going to certainly uh, affect that individual. You also end up sometimes with situations where there's more than one individual down and you're trying to almost do a little bit of a prior prioritizing process and it's not always the person who is screaming loudest who's the problem if they are motionless or quiet they might actually be obviously the ones that you need to go to so don't just listen to the sound effects and again there may be sort of some big facial injuries that you need to almost send people off to plastic surgery or maxifacial surgery any eye problems or nose problems you're going to get them off for uh, ent assessment really but again, key really is make sure you apply mills. It might be that they've landed in a supine position. They may be in a seated position. They might have their face head down and you may need to almost get them onto their backs to manage their airways and breathing and things and so forth. Key with that really is just make sure that if they are on their front and their head is rotated, you do not move the uh, angulation of that head until you have cleared that C-spine. You may well need to pack them in the angled position if there is resistance or pain or increased neurological symptoms. But as with everything, you are gonna go through a regimental process. So is it safe to approach? Go through the airway, go through the breathing, the circulation, think about disability, uh, and that is a disability in, in the sense of almost um, that you think of, you're almost thinking sort of avpus and that Glasgow coma scale. So how responsive are they to verbal stimulus, painful stimulus, etc. Concussions will all need to go through a scat. If they have any red flags, they are going to be packaged and monitored and handed over to A&E for appropriate management and imaging. Um, and also, if it is an HIA, they are going to go through um, a 13 minute um, investigation that is again, a very thorough assessment on various different multiple uh, components of that uh, cognitive and sort of symptoms uh, status really. Other things you wanna look at are is changes in personality or maybe ability to follow instructions if they look like they're struggling on the pitch to almost follow plays. That is key. But if you have any doubt, any sort of potential inkling that there may be something going on with the head, if in doubt, just sit them out, bring them off and monitor them for any deterioration of any of those symptoms on the right hand side. They are going to follow a graduated return to play process. If this is their first concussion, it may well vary if it is sort of a repeat offender. And you might also want to be thinking about how you apply 
the recommendations of the graduate and return to play into your specific sport environment. So we've done this here based on rugby. So just in terms of sort of summary of that suboptimal management, again, if you're in any doubt, sit them out. If they have any distracting injuries, you cannot rule out sort of C-spine um, until you uh, almost kind of do that in a, in a logical fashion. They are going to follow a graduate return to play and be aware of any persistent symptoms. There are associated conditions that can come with concussion. We had a few players who um, had this coming to our club and maybe some who developed some problems later on in life. Who knows, but there's certainly a lot more publicity to do with this. And again, the implications of not managing this correctly is medical retirement or potential fatality. So again, make sure you're getting these things right um, when you're managing them. So just in summary, I know that's a lot of information to take, but match days can be very unpredictable and they can be very stressful when these sort of situations arise, your emotions are running high and your adrenaline and your heart is pumping like crazy. Now, some people can obviously do this in a very smooth way. People re refer to it like almost be like a swan, be calm on the outside, but your sort of legs are going like the clappers underneath really. But again, if you haven't prepared appropriately, you will get yourself into a pickle with this. It's not enough just to do it once per season, you need to keep revisiting it to maintain that skill set. And do that with your MDT, your multidisciplinary team. Review and reflect on any situations that arise. Create moulages as well, so different scenarios, a bit like the ones that we used before. Somebody's gone down, maybe they've taken a head impact, maybe they've gone down, taken sort of a um, maybe potential fracture or whatever. And just go through how you would manage those situations. Always check. Never assume kit is as you've left it. I can't stress that enough. Someone took the beds from where I'd left them on that sort of uh, day down in Bedford um, for an academy setup, and then I hadn't rechecked again the next morning. Early recognition, action, and onward referral in appropriate cases. So you aren't the specialist in everything. There are people who have much better skill sets to manage a lot of these conditions than you. So if you need to refer them on to A&E or to a plastics or an ENT specialist, then you need to do that. So congrats. That is basically a guide from me on how to manage various different things in pitch side. Obviously, anything can occur, but hopefully this gives you a fair old sort of platform to build on. This is a, a great example um, of just one of many different uh, parts of the mentorship program that we have at growphysio.com. If you aren't familiar, there's loads of extra information and learning on Instagram as well at grow.physio. I hope you've really enjoyed it and taken a lot from the presentation. I certainly love sharing with you a lot of the sort of experiences that I've had. And ideally at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is just improve the management of athletes and injuries and put them and yourselves in the best possible place. So hopefully I'll see you again soon. Take care and look after yourselves. Perfect. Thanks for, for that, Steve. There's a few questions that have um, come through and I've enjoyed watching those videos, especially the um, Dupla C one with the physio. I think that's a, it's a great one you found there. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, my headphones in. Yeah, I think that's the um, a perfect example of where I think emotions can definitely get the better of people and especially in a high pressure, high performance environment. Um, but it's a win at all costs. I think it's a, it's a great example to put in there and I'm sure there's a few others as well. So um, I'm conscious of time. So let's get straight into it. I know somebody's put, um, I think Melanie's put about copy of the presentation. There is, we'll send the recording out to everybody that signed up. Um, but if you need to access it over and over again, then obviously it's all available on the Grow Physio um, platform as well. So, but we won't be able to send out the actual presentation um, to you guys, but like I said, check out and grow physio and you can get unlimited access to it for that time. Um, so I've got a question here. So Nahid said, if a player lands with head rotated and you apply uh, mills to stabilize CX spine in the position you find them, how do you package player in this position on spinal board if you suspect unstable CX fracture? Yeah, so that is probably one of your scenarios which you dread, isn't it really? Someone face down, neck rotated, um, plus or minus unconscious or um, 
yeah, not responding to you really. So again, I think the tricky thing with this, and again, I would sort of certainly advise going on a qualification course for this because they will go through this in far more detail in terms of log rolling. And it's quite difficult to explain over the phone. But I think one of the, the key things really on here, to be honest, is just to make sure that your thumbs are almost sort of facing towards the patient's eyes. Now that can be a little bit awkward. So the first person who's on there will always apply mills. Now, if you're lucky enough to have a second body with you, um, obviously they can then feed that information back in again. Uh, and as I kind of went through before, everyone needs to be rehearsed. But I would always say when you approach, if you can apply mills, have your thumbs almost sort of facing towards the patient's eyes. If possible, try not to cover the ears is another big one. So if they aren't responding, it might be that you are just literally suffocating their ears and they can't hear you because you've covered them. Is something that you see quite a lot. If you are going to take them off the field of play and you are the person who is the most qualified to do that and you are qualified to do that, and, and I wouldn't say that you are uh, able to do that on the back of just today, um, I do recommend a, a proper qualified course. But if you are that person, you can't take somebody off the field of play if they are in prone. You're going to have to get them onto a scoop or a spinal board and then uh, obviously extricate them appropriately from that position. Now, you're going to have to roll them. But again, I sort of alluded to it during the presentation. If you're going to do that, you need to almost make sure you maintain the same angulation of the head or the neck during that roll. And do not try to almost reposition that as you go around the temptation, as you go from a rotated position into a neutral position. But if there is some sort of fracture or unstable C-spine presentation, significant neural compromise, et cetera, and you put them back into neutral and you haven't almost eased that in looking for any signs of pain and you sort of increase in neural symptoms, my recommendation would be sort of do that because you otherwise you run the risk potentially of um, making the situation worse. Perfect. And there's a couple of questions here. So, Steve, if you've kind of answered them from your previous answer, then just just we'll move on to the next one. Um, so I think you may have touched this one. Anna said, how do you perform manual neck stabilisation in prone position um how does the victim breathe oh the victim sounds so harsh doesn't know, it yeah. <laughs> the victim to uh, c-spine injury um yeah i would say sort of similar really i would come in again with those sort of thumbs facing towards the eyes and um, it always looks a little bit awkward you're going to have your hands sort of almost pre-positioned um and think about where you're going to roll them to so if they have an injured side ideally you obviously don't want to try and roll them onto that sort of side really and as you're rotating them decide before you start really which way you're going to go and which way your hands are going to end up in so ideally you don't end up in a bit of a spaghetti junction really if they are prone with your arms so you need to sort of almost rotate your arms accordingly really and then come with them so your hands are then in a neutral position um, and that takes a bit of getting used to so i would certainly recommend create some little moulages that, or situations with your team that you're working with and put somebody in prone in those awkward positions so you do get your handling right because it it does look a little bit higgledy-piggledy as you sort of line yourself up but it makes sense as they start to roll that you come into a more neutral position perfect and um interesting one here from dominic so he said um if there are no radio comms devices available uh, would you would you suggest agreeing hand signals with staff on the side, um, e.g. calling for a stretcher? Yeah, absolutely. So I think even if you have a radio, there are set signs that we will use. And again, that's that whole sort of preparation for this. And, and the key ones are, yeah, basically extrication stretches that you need or sort of almost the full sort of trauma bag to come on, really. So if you are approaching something and you suspect that there's something immediately, obviously you can shout to a player and say, do you mind relaying that back to the bench to get the defib on, the trauma kit, etc." cetera. Um, but again, sort of there are almost international signs for each of these sort of scenarios really. So I would try and get that across as soon as possible. Um, Cause obviously the sooner you get airway adjuncts and things on there, maybe some sort of cardiac support with the defib, it's going to put the, the athlete in a much better position um, for recovering quicker because it's, um, again, you're going to have to find what you need out of your bag potentially. So if you do have things in your kit bag that you are in your run-on bag anyway, like your airway management bits and pieces again, or sort of pocket masks, you'd always want to carry some of those things if you were needing them sort of almost imminently. Uh, and then the extra range of material and um sort of equipment that you may use from a life-saving uh, side of things will really come in that trauma bag. 
Perfect. And then um, another question here. So when in the mill's position, from your experience, how would you clear the C-spine and questions you would ask the athlete? Yeah, so this is a really tricky situation. If you have somebody with you and you have applied mills or an anterior hold position, um, again, you sort of almost, you can't take your hands off that individual until somebody else has C-spine control. Otherwise, if there is movement, again, you can worsen that situation. So I think if you have somebody who is down and you suspect a C-spine um, injury and you are the first one on and you are the medic involved in that, I would always try and apply an anterior hold position. So one arm, sort of your forearm will go down the line of the sternum and at the same time you've almost got the support um, of the head above Y. So you're almost clamping it in that position. And then it's easier, I find, to almost talk through someone what a mills position is because then they're almost just sliding their hands either side of the head and they can hold that position and then you've got your hands free to clear the C-spine. It's much harder with one person. And I would say if it's a one person, go into that sort of anterior stabilization position and then almost get someone to take mills for you because it's easier to talk someone through that. And then you've got your hands free to go through C-spine, um, sort of midline palpation. If there's any pain there, again, you can't exclude a fracture. And if it's true bony tenderness that's there, also you can then do your rotation sort of 45 degrees each side really. Um, and again, you're looking for any increase in symptoms, neural signs, anything that may indicate that there's something else compromised really. Perfect. And then, so Rob has asked, um, Steve, have you ever used glue on a wound? Uh, I did. Um, I haven't used it for a long time, to be honest, but I think that's probably because we've usually had a doctor on site. Um, it's not a bad option, to be fair. We used it with some of the sort of semi-pro athletes in my earlier days, really, um, because it was something that we could apply. And it wasn't sort of a, if it was something fairly small, again, it was sometimes enough to almost adhere um, the sort of little smaller injury-related problems together. I think anything that is potentially facial related um, again you want to be pretty careful with what you're doing that's probably the place where it's actually quite useful if it's something small um, but again if it is something that is going to be affect the way that somebody looks particularly facially um, I would almost try and steer clear unless you are that speciality to be honest there's people far better situated you saw a picture of one of our fullbacks on there um, after he had his sort of head split um, and again you're not going to go anywhere near that you want going to be someone who's going to ever uh, apply internal stitches or probably not external stitches as a physio either, particularly not in the face. So refer on where, wherever necessary, really. Brilliant. And so I think we'll do a final one now because I uh, appreciate it's been a long one for everybody tonight. So um, what would, it's a good one to finish on here, actually. I don't know who's put it in, but who uh, what what is your top tip for pitch side related work? So what's the biggest takeaway, I think, from this evening if people are working, working pitch side? I think it's all the preparation side of things. And it's not very glamorous, but if you are, are, you, if you are faced with a situation that you haven't prepared for, um, and again, I think probably everybody will go through this at some stage if you are working in sport, but if you, you are presented with something that you have absolutely no idea how to manage and you aren't prepared for it, um, your heart will be ticking and you will not be of a great deal of use to that individual on the pitch, really. Um, you will be far better situated, I'd say, if you go through a range of different conditions. Just think about how different athletes or individuals may present in different situations. And that might be away from trauma. So it might not be some fracture dislocation thing. It might be a medical scenario where you've got diabetics, epileptics, um, other various bits and pieces that are going on there and think about maybe how they would present and then how you would manage them accordingly. Um, because they're very common. You are going to come across athletes who have underlying medical conditions and manage them in various different ways. Um, and I would just say that, yeah, the more you rehearse that process with the team that you are working with, that would be the thing which I would say is the, the massive benefit um, sort of preparation wise really because when it does happen you're then far better suited in position to deal with it yeah that's a brilliant one so preparation is key um perfect i know there's a, a couple of other questions and stuff i think we'll, we'll leave it there but if you do have any other questions or you want to get in touch with steve or check out the grow physio stuff then obviously we've we've sent through the 
the details but um and obviously on the presentation and stuff it has all the, the links but yeah drop a message i'm sure steve you'd be happy to answer any other ones that come through on social absolutely the only other big shout out that i have oh, yeah. if he's still on actually is naz islam um who was my thousandth follower on uh, Instagram. So uh, Naz, I'll be in touch with you if you're still on um, and we'll give you sort of a few months access to the Grow Physio platform as a little bit of a uh, pro, promo thing. But yeah, I guess if anyone else wants to jump on that Instagram thing, grow.physio, um, have a little check out. But yeah, Naz, I'll get in touch with you um, and then we'll set something up for you. But yeah, massive thank you for everyone for tuning in really. Uh, and again, hopefully your sport opens up. This has been really useful for you. There's lots of other material on there. Um, but yeah, fair play to you, you're not in beer gardens and restaurants, to be fair, the day after it's all opened up. So uh, a massive thank you from me. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, thanks, Steve, again. Um, and thanks, everybody, for um, joining us this evening. Like Steve says, we know restrictions and sport and everybody back out, it's, always, it's going to be a bit tougher to, to join on these things. But yeah, thank you to everybody. Thanks, Steve. Um, and yeah, I'll see you for the next one. Well, thanks, guys.